let's turn now to um, uh, exploring the Shema, discussions on the issues of Trinity. And this is the uh, paper to Yahweh and Yeshua. And we're, we're talking about the, the larger question of is Yeshua God? Um, that type of question. And we've been working our way through a passage in John chapter 1, where we looked at uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit called God at different passages. Uh, and we're focused now on the Son called God. You can see this little chart I've got pulled up that Karn put together. And we're in this little section right here where the Son is called God, this little table. And we're still in John 1.14. Um, we've already looked at John 1.1. 1, 1. Go back and listen to the, the audio podcast or read the commentary or watch the, the YouTube videos that I put out on that. And then two weeks ago, we started into this idea of um, how Jesus is called the only begotten Son in John 1.14. So let's look at this verse uh, one more time, and we'll continue, and we'll probably finish John 1.14 tonight. And then we're going to take a break for two weeks so that we can enjoy the festivals, the fall feasts. Right? I want you to congregate if you've got the opportunity to do so. Don't, don't meet with me. Meet with your local congregations and your local Bible studies and things like that, your local churches, uh, for the next two weeks. And then we'll pick up our study again after two weeks, okay? John 1.14, in a few different versions, as you can see, I've got pulled up on my screen. Um, there's a phrase right in the middle where it says, the one and only Son. And we can see as we look at different versions that... Um, some versions use this phrase begotten, begotten, but others use this phrase the one and only, right? Um, why do we have the differences of, of translation? Is it begotten or is it the one and only, right? For instance, if you've got a KJV, you're going to have the phrase begotten. But if you have, say, the NASB, I'm sorry, or the um, ESV, you're going to have the, uh, the one and only son, the one and only. So what is the correct translation? Let's just look at the Greek real quick. I've got uh, Bible Hub's uh, Romans 14 pulled up in the interlinear, so you can see this. Um, and let me just read the English, the wooden translation, then I'll go back and read the Greek real quick. Uh, from a wooden translation perspective, verse 14 says, when I say wooden, I mean word for word as the same word order as the Greek, uh, which means it's no true version. It's just a, a kind of a clunky wooden version. But listen to this. Uh, this would read... And the word flesh became and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of him, a glory as of an only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. If we go back and look at the original Greek, we can see right above that. It says, Kai halagos sarx agenato, kai eskenosin en haman, kai ethiasamatha, ethiasamatha, tain doxen autu, doxen hos managenus, para patras pleres, Charitas kai aletheus. The phrase in question for us tonight is um, hos monogenus. And this phrase monogenus that we see here, of and only begotten. If we click on the word uh, monogenus, uh, Strong's number 3439, and it brings up the definition for us, we can see that this phrase monogenus is rooted in the phrase, in the word monogenes, the original Greek word monogenes, Strong's number 3439. And it can refer to only, or it could be translated as begotten, only, only begotten, or unique. Um, and they say that it's from monogenes, from a few different words, uh, uh, misthotos, misthotos, I'm sorry, uh, genos, offspring, uh, one of a kind, um, monos, uh, one of a class literary, or uh, genos, only of its kind. So the question really becomes, is it better translated as one and only, as in unique, or is it better translated as begotten? And is there really an issue here? Let me just tell you right up front to kind of give you the short answer, because I know many of you might get lost in my longer explanation. So let me give the short explanation and issue right up front and tell you why we're even having this discussion. Throughout history, when we, incur when we in uh, uh, interact with the biblical terminology from the Greek and translate it into a receptor language, those translations color or influence the way we perceive what the Bible is trying to tell us. And when we think about the phrase begotten in English, it often connoted historically the perhaps idea that Jesus was brought into existence from a time where he did not previously exist such as when two, um, uh, when a couple gets together, husband and wife get together and they produce a child, that child is begotten. He's brought into existence. He's born. He's birthed. 
And so when we hear Jesus being described as being begotten from the Father, then we begin to ask ourselves the question, without knowing the background behind the phrase and the Greek and, and the underlying uh, Hebrew, Hebraic uh, perspective, we begin to entertain questions as to whether or not the Bible is trying to tell us that Jesus was created by God the Father. Was he birthed into existence, as it were, by God the Father? In other words, was there a time when Jesus did not exist, and therefore begotten is indication of his being brought into existence? We already know that this is the perspective of the new of the uh, New World Translation. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the popular um, uh, Arian uh, theology uh, Christology that's uh, taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses. I've got my screen pulled up right now. JW.org, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, New World Translation, and we can read in John 1:14. So the Word became flesh and resided among us, and we had a view of His glory, a glory such as belongs to an only begotten Son from a Father. He was full of divine favor and truth. And if you look over on the right side of their um, page here, they've got a discussion about only begotten. And from their perspective, it's a reference to um, Jesus being brought into existence by being created by God. And so um, they say uh, right here, uh, Jesus is the only begotten son because he was Jehovah's firstborn and the only one created directly by God. You understand their position? Jesus is existence is not eternal. And the phrase begotten, monogenes in the Greek from the word, I'm sorry, monogenus, as it's, um, as we see it, uh, the form of it in the Greek from the root word monogenes, the Jehovah's Witnesses from their Aryan perspective teaches that Jesus is not an eternal being. His person is not from eternity like the Father. Rather, his existence was brought into history at the time when God decided to create him. Indeed, he is God's very first creation. He's God's first creature, spirit creature. And then Jesus, the spirit creature, created everything else. All of creation flowed forth from Jesus, but God himself exclusively created Jesus. So that, of course, runs counter to the Orthodox Christian Trinitarian position that Jesus is uncreated, right? The issue of, um, of begetting is an issue of eternal begetting, meaning the Trinitarian fathers, the, the early church fathers, the patristic writings, agree with the position that Jesus has an eternal begetting. Yes, the terminology is begotten, but it doesn't refer to a, a, um, a creation, so let's look at this um, this perspective. Let's look at how we arrived at going from uh, eternal beginning, or, or or is it in fact an eternal beginning? In other words, why do we even have this discussion at all? Let's turn to our author Tim Haig once again. We'll, we'll close our, out our discussion night looking at Tim Haig. He has a commentary that is available. Wow, I noticed the highlights that they, they stayed, the bookmarking. He has a commentary available, not online for free. Um, but it is available for purchase. It's a, it's a commentary to the book of Romans. And so I'm going to borrow some notes from his commentary. We're not going to read uh, as much as we read last time, just maybe a paragraph or two. So let's pick up this discussion in Romans uh, 14. Um, I'm sorry, Romans, uh, um, um, John 1, 14, not Romans. <laughs> this commentary actually is entitled um, uh, Christology. Uh, and it's it's not available uh, for free. It, you do have to purchase it, but um, it's kind of a seminary level uh, uh, commentary. But let's pick up his discussion about John 1.14. Let's pick up the reading right there. Um, Tim Hicks says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. What he's first going to do is highlight us to the idea of um, uh, uh, John, um, speaking of Yeshua being brought into the world through the incarnation, right? The Word which was eternally with God. If you recall John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, like Jehovah's Witnesses say, but very God, like John intended us for us to understand. That's the perspective that Tim Hicks is going to work from. And uh, appropriately appropriate for our um, time that we're talking about, which is uh, the fall festivals and tabernacle being right around the corner. Tim Egg is also going to talk about how that there's language here that John is hinting at perhaps um, the birth of Messiah or um, uh, since it's the incarnation of Jesus uh, from the word to the, the to the man and the fact that uh, perhaps his birth was around the timing of tabernacles. We'll see that here in a moment. So let me just read. Um, here we have a direct contrast to the verb to be utilized in verse 1. In the beginning the word was, but here the word becomes. So we have a geneto uh, from ginomai, 
uh, to be born, to become. So, yes, the word became flesh. There is a beginning here, right? Again, it though. And it's because an incarnation took place from the eternal word of God, which eternally existed with God, to the presence of a man, the existence of a man being brought into history, into humanity, through the incarnation, the birth of Jesus the man. Right, so that's what, what Heg's uh, highlighting. Paul utilizes the same verb in Philippians 2, 7, being made in the likeness of men, right, being uh, made. Here is the supreme mystery that the word who was God should become flesh. Once again, John's use of the circumlocution word fits his purpose perfectly, for it was not the Father who became flesh, but the Son, yet the Son is one with the Father. Utilizing the concept of the Logos, John is able to emphasize the realities of Emmanuel without confusing the unique identities of the Father and the Messiah. And he goes on to say that here, the Word becomes something he was not previously, that is, a human being with all of the characteristics and weaknesses that Mark created humanity, mankind. John's words were straightforward and clear. The humanity of Yeshua is neither a facade nor a superhumanity. He became one like us, read Hebrews 2.14, in order to redeem us. And he continues. Let's keep reading in, the, in his commentary, starting right there. And so he pitched his tent, the Greek word skinao, um, or as it's, it's uh, 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 parged out, eskinosin, uh, eskinosin. Uh, he pitched his tent among us. The language that John uses is clearly to bring to the reader's mind the dwelling of God among the people of Israel in the earthly tabernacle. The Hebrew word shachan, to dwell, is the root from which the word tent, the mishkan, is derived. Interestingly, the Greek verb contains the same consonants as the Hebrew root. So we have the Hebrew shachan and the Greek skenao, right? Same S K N and S-K-N from the Hebrew and the Greek, which is really interesting. Ahead continues, And the fact that the rabbinic term used to describe the glory of God seen hovering over the tabernacle was Shekhinah works perfectly for John's prologue as well. Even as the dwelling of God among Israel was in the Mishkan and his Shekhinah shown forth as proof of his dwelling among them, so Yeshua is the Mishkan, the tabernacle, right? Feast of Tabernacles, in which the Shekhinah, the glory of God, is seen. So notice all of those Shekhinah, Shekhan, Eskinau, uh, um, all of that kind of uh, kind of playing off one another in this wordplay. Um uh, uh, Tim Hay continues right there. This glory was none other than that of the only begotten from the Father. Hague states, only begotten, this phrase in English, translates a single word in the Greek. Monogenes, or monogenous is how it's actually parsed out, or how we see it actually um the form, the Greek form in the, in the literal Greek, but the root word is monogenes, which means, quote, the one, the only one of its kind in a particular relationship, unique in kind. So listen up for a moment. Haig brings to our attention the LXX, which is the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which was in use in Paul's day, in John's day, in the early first century, right? It's one of the earliest translations of the Bible, of the, of the Hebrew Bible, into another language. The LXX uses the word translate to translate Yahid, which means only or singular, as, for example, of Jephthah's daughter in Judges 1134, as is one and only. And you can compare that from Psalm 2221, Psalm 2516, and Psalm 3517. But, Haig notes, notes, Yahid is also translated in the Septuagint with um, Agapeptas. And Aga, Agapeptas which is translated as beloved. You can even hear agape, which is the word for love, right? Agape tas, beloved, is also used to translate from the original Hebrew word of yahid. So the Hebrew yahid ends up with two Greek words. One is monogenes, and the other is agape tas. So these are two possibilities. Thus, the trans, the LXX, when it rec when it saw the original Hebrew word yahid, it brought together the concept of only unique from Yahid and Monogenes with that of beloved from Agape, Aga, Agapeta. I'm sorry, I think I'm mispronouncing. Agapetas. I said Peptas. I'm ending, to, ending, ending uh, one extra letter there. Agapetas. 
So Agape Tas and um, Monogenes kind of work together to form the, the, the idea of, of one and only, unique, and beloved. They kind of work together. So significantly, Yahid in Genesis 22.2 is translated by the Septuagint with, with um, Agape Tas. Now take your son, your only son, even though, right, that's the LXX, take your beloved son, um, whom you love, uh, even though the original Hebrew said um, Yahid, the translator of the um, Septuagint didn't use the word monogenes. Instead, it used the word um, agapetas. So, uh, Haig continues, the writer to the book of Hebrews, alluding to Gen Genesis 22, uses monogenes of Isaac. By faith, Abraham, when he tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten, his monogenes son. So, notice... Notice, let me just go back and look at that one more time. The translation of Genesis 22-2, translated by the Septuagint, where the original Hebrew is Yahid, uses the Greek word agapetas. Understand that? But the writer to the book of Hebrews, even though he's aware of the Septuagint using agapetas, for Yahid, the original Hebrew, he opts for monogenes when he writes in Genesis 22 and is referring to when he's making this quote. So understand what I'm, what's going on here? The writer to the book of Hebrews, who had two Greek words that he could have pulled from, agapetas and monogenes, he opts for monogenes, even though the Septuagint uses agapetas. So that's kind of what's going on, and that's what uh, Hig. Now we we get we have to start asking ourselves, why, <laughs> right? Uh, so when we look at the verse here in Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, whom he had received the promise of offering up his only begotten Monica and his son. Hebrews eleven seventeen. We can see then that when John writes of Yeshua that he is the only begotten from the Father, he's stressing his unique relationship with the Father. One characterized by a unique love. Notice the overlap of those two concepts of monogenes in the Greek and agapetas, right? We have the unique relationship and unique love. And the fact that the same word monogenes in the Greek is used in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that his, his only begotten son is monogenes son, stresses the fact that since Yeshua is the one and only son, it is through him alone that salvation may be secured. So what is our conclusion? What is our conclusion? Um, the, uh, let me just read this one last paragraph here, and that will form our conclusion for tonight's study. Haig concludes by saying, It was from this verse and others which speak of Yeshua as begotten, right, monogenes, and yet with overtones of agapetas, beloved. So he's unique, but he's beloved. He's unique in a kind. Um, it is... This verse, that the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son was formulated during the Christological debates of the early Christian centuries, right? Early first centuries, we have these debates. Is Jesus begotten? Was he brought into existence by God? Was he created by God? What does begotten mean? In this regard, recall that Psalm 2-7 formed additional basis for the doctrine, quote, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Quote, you are my son today, I have begotten you, end quote. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. This, of course, would have been known to John. And the word begotten there in the psalm, in the psalm is uh, in the Septuagint. We're going to we'll look at this next week um, as to exactly which Greek word is used. I want, don't want to go into it tonight. But in short, Tim Haig reminds us that there are those who sought to interpret these texts as indicating a point in time in which Yeshua came into being denying his eternal pre-existence. So that is the issue behind why we're looking at, you remember the various translations, some say an only son from the Father, and some say an only begotten from the Father. Why do we have differences in translations? Why do some bring up the phrase begotten? And why do others leave off the phrase begotten and go for simply only and unique or only one from the Father or something like that? And again, if we looked at the Greek, there's only one Greek word, monogenes, the original, and yet this word monogenes has connotations of only unique or only begotten. And we have to begin to 
ask ourselves, what is the stress that John is laying on this word? And what would have been the background theology for him stressing the word that he used? Tim Hay concludes by saying, this was done on the basis of the word begot. It's talking about the, the heresy of teaching that Jesus was created by God. This heresy, this discussion, this presupposition, this theology, was done on the basis of the word begot, reason that just as a parent begets a child, so the father brought the son into, be, into being. Right? Seems to make sense. Seems like the Jehovah's Witnesses and their Arian, Arian Christology has a point to make that Jesus was created. By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't the only ones who come to this position. Many oneness Pentecostals have this similar position. Many oneness theologians um, uh, have the same idea that Jesus was is the chief creation of God, uh, that he's a creature, and that he is the chief creature of God's creating. Tim Haig says, yet those who held to the eternal pre-existence of the Son, such as we uh, Orthodox Trinitarians, those of us holding to the eternal preexistence of the Son, wanting to retain the aspect of sonship, which the term begotten enforced, still needed to affirm their belief that Yeshua had no beginning in terms of his, etern- of his essential being. They uh, therefore used the term eternal generation, but which has meant that his relationship to the Father as Son is an eternal relationship. So, in closing, we're simply trying to affirm that there is a word used in the Greek that John used that has some different connotations for its background, as evidenced by the Septuagint. We'll look at this in two weeks. We have this phrase monogenes, and how John spun this word is going to help us understand the force of the context of why he's using it the way he's using it and how it's rooted in the book of Psalms and uh, other words that are used in Septuagint. But in closing, we can make a case that John is not referring to Jesus being brought into existence the way a son or daughter is brought into existence by their parents. That's not what the word begotten has to imply, like the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching. Instead, John is bringing to our uh, um Um, knowledge, the fact that Jesus is the eternal begotten Son, the only unique Son of God in terms of his relationship to God the Father and in terms of his covenant responsibility as the Son who inherits the responsibilities as passed down from the Father when it comes to um, inheriting the kingdom and continuing on the um, the, the, the rulership and things like that. And we'll discuss that in two weeks. But for now, let's bring our, bring our commentary to a close.